Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, my dear respected viewers, brothers and sisters in Islam. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon you. Hello and welcome to the 30th episode of the Treaties of Rights series with me, your host, Ali Jassim. Today we will discuss the right of those under the protection of Islam. Regarding this, Imam Sajjad Zain al-Abidin has said, and the right of those under the protection of Islam is that you should accept from them what God has accepted from them and fulfill what God has established for them under his protection and covenant and entrust them to him in what they are required to carry out and are obliged to do. And you should judge among them with the judgments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he commanded for you regarding the conditions of dealing with them and do not wrong them as long as they honor God's covenant and fulfill their pledge. And the pledge of the Prophet, may Allah peace and blessings be upon him as pure household, is a barrier since it is reported that he said, I am the adversary of whoever oppresses one who has a treaty. Therefore, fear God, and there is no power but on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Arabic word dhimma means a pledge or a covenant. It has appeared in the following verses. For example, how can there be such a league seeing that if they get an advantage over you, they respect not in you the ties either of kinship or of covenant? With fair words from their mouth, they entice you, but their hearts are averse from you, and most of them are rebellious and wicked. The Holy Quran, al Toba, chapter 9, verse 8. In a believer, they respect not the ties either of kinship or of covenant. It is they who have transgressed all bounds. The Holy Quran, al Toba, chapter 9, verse 10. Those under the protection of Islam refers to the Jews and the Christians who live under the rule of an Islamic government and have a covenant with the Muslims. There are two references to this in the Holy Quran. We read in Nahjul Balagha the following regarding the various social classes. And there are people amongst them who pay taxes and tributes. The people of the book are the non-Muslims who adhere to one of the divine books that are mentioned in the Holy Quran. These people are considered to be under the protection of Islam. They must pay taxes to the state in order to benefit from the support of the government while living in an Islamic country. Then the Islamic government protects their lives and their property using this revenue. According to Islamic jurisprudence, the people of the book who live under the protection of Islam can rely on their own religious jurisprudence regarding their divine affairs and can go to Muslim judges regarding their personal or economic affairs. The Muslim judge will judge between them according to Islamic principles. In such cases, the people of the book under the protection of Islam can rely on their own religious authorities too. From this, we see that the religion of Islam is a religion that never forced its teachings onto anyone. On the contrary, it greatly respects other religions. It was stated that Jews and Christians who live in an Islamic country are under the protection of Islam. Now, let's see that based on the Quran. What duties we have towards the people of the book? Consider the following verse in this regard. Fight those who believe not in God nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which has been forbidden by God and his apostle, nor acknowledge the religion of the truth, even if they are of the people of the book, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. The Holy Quran al Tawbah, chapter 9, verse 29. We see that Islam has established an in-between law for them, something that, between that for Muslims and infidels. This is because the people of the book who follow the principles of a divine holy book are somewhat similar to Muslims, but in some respects they are close to the infidels. It is for this reason that we are not permitted to kill them. However, we are only allowed to accommodate them in the Muslim society if they agree to peacefully live with Muslims, respect the Muslims, and do not rebel against the Muslims. Now, since they were non-Muslim, they were required to pay what is called a poll tax. Poll tax is a form of tax that is taken from non-Muslims who live under the protection of Islam. They pay this tax so that the Islamic government can protect their lives and their property. Some people believe that the origin of the Arabic word used for poll tax is derived from ancient Persia. At that time, a certain type of tax was levied to strengthen the army. Others believe to be a purely Arabic word that refers to tax taken to provide security for religious minorities. In chapter 7, we referred to the text of the covenant between Khalid ibn al-Walid and Salvaba, the elder of the Christians, regarding the imposition of tax in return for being under the protection of Islam. Let's go for a quick short break. Stay tuned. Thank you. 
Welcome back, my dear viewers. Some people believe that the first instance of poll tax is related to the Sasanian king Anushiravan. It is certainly known that Anushiravan was the first ruler to levy taxes on the nation. He charged taxes to all non-governmental workers between the age of 20 and 50. He charged 4, 6, 8 or 12 dirhams per person. It is known that the philosophy behind this tax was to collect money in order to defend the country and its independence. To accomplish these objectives, some personally participate in the defense activities while others support them through paying annual taxes. The age of taxpayers be being between 20 and 50 years implies that it was levied only on those who could carry weapons and participate in defense activities, but did not do so because of their engagement in a job. Muslims do not have to pay such taxes because all Muslims are required to participate in a holy war when needed, but non-Muslims are not obliged to participate in a holy war, but they must pay taxes. The other reason supporting this idea is the exemption of ch the children, old men, women, and the blind men from religious minorities. Therefore, we realize that this form of tax is a form of financial assistance provided by the people of the book in return for the protection that the Muslims offer them to safeguard their lives and property. Therefore, those who consider this form of tax as payment to a conqueror that have Therefore, those who consider this form of tax as payment to a conqueror have not paid attention to the real meaning behind it. They should realize that the people of the book receive full protection under an Islamic government by paying this tax. In addition, they become totally exempt from having to participate in defense activities or engaging in holy wars. In the verses cited above, we read, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. This implies that the payment of this tax is a sign of their submission to Islam. Islam and the Holy Quran. In other words, it implies their readiness to peacefully live as a religious minority among the ruling majority. Now, what do the jurisprudence say about the poll tax? The first question on the jurisprudence ruling on poll tax is one who should pay this tax. Then it deals with how much they should be charged and the conditions for that. In Shara al Islam by Muhaqqaq, we read take it from those who confess to their religion being the Jews the Christians and those who are thought to follow the holy book being the Magians. Imam Ali salam said the Magians are attached to the Jews and the Christians and are treated the same regarding the poll tax and the blood compensation issues since they have a divine book in the past. There are traditions which state that the prophet of the Magians was named Damast and their book was called Jamast which was recorded on 12,000 cowskins. They were all burnt. The poll tax cannot be taken from those other than the people of the book. The Holy Quran says the following regarding the pagans. Then fight and slay the pagans wherever ye find them. The Holy Quran in Tawbah chapter 9 verse 5. The case of the idol worshippers is also clear. Therefore, the poll tax can only be taken from these three groups of religious people if they adhere to their conditions of the covenant. There is no distinction between the Persians or the Arabs in this regard. No taxes can be charged to children or the mentally ill. What is known from the companions is that there is no fixed amount for this tax. The amount is based on the opinion of the leader and the financial ability of the taxpayers to pay it. What we understand from Islamic history is that it is set to be a very small amount, sometimes about one dirham, or what the taxpayer can pay. As Shia Muslims, we have always been taught to defend the oppressed no matter who they are or what religion they belong to. In a sermon to the people of the Kufa, Imam Ali salam said, I have been informed that their men, soldiers of the army of Muawiyah, would enter the house of the Muslim woman and the woman under the protection of Islam snatching their anklets, bracelets, necklaces and earrings. She could not put up any resistance to them but to recite the verse of, We are from God and to Him shall we return. Chapter 2, verse 156, and to ask them for mercy. Then they would leave laden with wealth, with not a man among them suffering a cut or their blood being shed. If a Muslim would die in grief after this, he would not be blameworthy. In fact, in my opinion, it would be worthy of him. When we see how much the leader of the Muslims gets upset, when a person under the protection of Islam is oppressed, 
then we realized how important it is to respect these rights. When Imam Ali Amir al mumin saw an old Christian man who was begging, he asked who he was. When they told him that he was a Christian, he said, you used him when he was young but have abandoned him in these conditions. Now that he is old and unable to work, then Imam Ali issued an order to, to the state to support him financially. One of the main moral issues regarding the people under the protection of Islam is respecting their covenant as expressed by Imam Sajjad salam. God has said in the following the Holy Quran, and fulfill every engagement, for every engagement will be inquired into on the day of reckoning. The Holy Quran, chapter 17, verse 34. He has also said, those who faithfully observe their trusts and their covenants. The Holy Quran, Al-Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse 8. Respecting the covenant is stressed in these two verses of the Holy Quran. This is considered one of the salient characteristics of believers. One will be held responsible for this and questioned about it in the hereafter. We can also recognize the importance of this issue from the traditions of the Noble Prophet and the Immaculate Imams. Ali ibn Ibrahim narrated that he heard Imam Sadiq salam say, The believer's promise to his brother is a vow that has no expiation. One must honor a promise just as one honors a vow. The Noble Prophet salam said, Whoever believes in God on the resurrection day should honor his promise. He also said, The nearest of you to me tomorrow at the station in the hereafter will be the most truthful of you in speech, the best of you in delivering the deposits entrusted to you, the most faithful of you in promise, the best of you in nature, and the nearest of you to people. With this, we conclude this episode. Stay tuned for another episode on the Treaties of Rights. Thank you all for watching, and may Allah hasten the reappearance of our beloved Man Mahdi alayhi salam. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.